Hey guys, so I just finished a conversation with Stacey Chapin, who is of course the mother of Ethan Chapin, who's one of the Idaho victims from the Idaho murders, uh, along with one of the executives from Othram. And Othram is this new cutting edge forensics company. Uh, they actually are the ones who tested the knife sheath initially uh, and figured out that there was DNA on it, which really cracked open the case and led everything back to Brian Koberger. Uh, I, I met up with Stacy uh, here, where I am now at CrimeCon, which is this big crime convention in Denver. But I wanted to share this conversation with you because I've always had so much respect for Stacy. But it's also fascinating uh, the world of forensics and how what they're learning could actually help other unsolved cases too. So, Stacy, I'll start with you. Um, I just wanted to say to sort of get off my chest like how much you've inspired so many people who have been following this case, um, me included. Um, just the way you've handled, the way your family has handled all of this with such uh, class and dignity. And I think you have inspired a lot of people who are going through things and that they can kind of get out on the other side. Um, and now partnering or working with Othram, um, it seems like you're kind of entering sort of in a way like the next chapter. I don't disagree with that, actually. It feels like a very natural um, transition, I guess. I didn't know where it was all going to end or begin or how it was ever going to play out. Um, but it made perfect sense when it, you know, when the gag order was lifted and, and we could have a conversation. It, it made perfect sense. Um, because we've, we're a, a face, we're a victim, we have been, you know, Othram is involved in our case. And so uh, it's just, yeah, it makes sense, right? And I, and thank you. I mean, I, we've tried to take the high road through our case, through the entire, you know, it's been almost, it'll be three years in November, obviously, but. Um, you just said that Stacy and the way that she handled this inspired you. Um, I had a question. I have this question all the time from people. How do you do the job that you do, see such evil, and and not be affected by it? And I have to say that I do. I see some really terrible things and some really terrible parts of humanity. But then I also see pure light, and I feel like Stacy is one of those people that went through the worst of what society can give you, the unimaginable. I can't imagine um, going through what Stacy went through, and instead of letting that define her she's actually turned the worst experience of her life into light and she wants to give back to the world in a positive way and advocate for justice and fairness for everyone advocate the technologies used in real time that means a lot to me um although we won't go into the details of exactly how we met until tomorrow at our talk so, so that people still wake up in the morning and, come to our talk. <laughs> and want to come um, um we bumped into each other by chance yeah. And yeah. this case was difficult because all of us were under a gag order and we couldn't have our first real conversation until that gag order was lifted. Yeah. And that was really difficult. Um, everything I do here at Othram, everything everyone here at Othram does is for the victims and their families. We're victim advocates first. And it's very difficult to meet your why and to not be able to tell them how you feel, what's going on in the case. Um, but those, that, that's the deck of cards we were dealt in, right, this, right. in this scenario. Mm -hmm. And we are here tomorrow and, and in, I think indefinitely to try to advocate that others aren't dealt the same deck of cards yeah. because it's a difficult one, right? To know that you have information that could help someone heal, that could help someone feel safe or secure and to not be able to give it to them is difficult. Um, to know that there's a family member out there wondering what is going on and everything that's in the media is incorrect, for a lack of a better word, or just speculation because everyone that worked this case, all the family members that were involved, none of us could speak. To the media yeah. you know that more than anyone right and so everyone speaking everyone out there giving interviews was speculating speculating with no knowledge with very little information what was going on and, and they painted the wrong picture and finally we have our voices back yeah, right. and we're excited yeah. to 
to tell the story. Was it? I'm, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stacey. No, I just was going to say you have to understand it's the most advanced technology, forensic DNA technology in the world. I'm not the scientist, but I've been on the receiving end of having them not only you know work on our case, but there's there was a comfort there. I mean, and that's part of the story we'll tell tomorrow, is that. Um, you know, we met by chance, and uh, and I had some knowledge throughout our case of, of what the middlemans were doing, and and I relied on that. Jim and I relied on that in our darkest moments. Um, I didn't know anything, you know, that I wasn't supposed to know, but it was it was a blessing. And, and victims' families should have the right to that information if they're going through the same thing we are. I mean, inevitably, there's going to be families that are in the same position we are. Yeah, I guess there would have been a lot more certainty had it been explained. It just would have, it would have, it, it's definitive information. There was so much, you know, so much speculation. There still is, it's shocking to me. Yeah, I mean, this um, is science. It's, it's scientific, yeah, right? No speculation. I mean, if you knew definitively that that knife sheath was without a shadow of doubt, which is the case, you know, now that it's all said and done, that would have, you would have, it would have been different going through. You would have relied on, you kind of went, okay, we, maybe we don't need to worry as much as we need to worry. Yeah, and there was one advanced forensic test performed. There was one profile. There was so much speculation out there about multiple profiles, yeah. incongruent information. There is only one lab that is doing this type of DNA technology that tested that DNA, and it's ours. And I couldn't, come forward and say, no, this is definitive. Right. There is one profile with these matches that led to this conclusion that pointed directly to Brian Kohlberger's family, right? That none of that could be said before, and that was very frustrating. And to not be able to tell the family or to talk about it, the law enforcement agents that worked this case couldn't talk about it. No one that had any information could correct the record. Right. And so what ended up happening is everyone tried to figure out why was this information not out there, what was missing, what was the missing component, and came up with a whole bunch of speculations that led to uncertainty. And that uncertainty continued to grow, and I think that was the most difficult on the victim's family. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, and no one else, right? Like, I was certain the entire time because I saw the science. I knew the results, right? I never had one doubt in my mind that we'd be sitting here today whenever today was, whether it's after the trial, before the trial at a plea, I knew that this day was gonna come. But the victim's families didn't have that right. certainty. I don't even know if law enforcement involved in the case had that right. certainty. I don't know how far the, the results actually propagated as the full result of the investigation because everything was kept so under wraps. And I think that that needs to change. Um, Stacy's right, this technology is superior to traditional DNA testing. Traditional DNA testing looks at 20 markers and is there to confirm identity. It was purpose-built in the 90s to help confirm someone's identity or connect someone to multiple crimes if they're a serial perpetrator. Our technology takes place much earlier in an investigation. We can infer someone's identity because we're looking at hundreds of thousands of markers, almost a million markers, every time we build one of these DNA profiles. So we can infer identity by looking at six cousins, fifth cousins, fourth cousins, and figuring out who left that DNA at the crime scene. By inferring that identity, we're giving that information to law enforcement. And I wanna make clear, because there are questions in our talk today for David, and I'm sure in our talk tomorrow, that we don't tell them this is your perpetrator. We say this person this person's profile or one of these two or three people in this family left DNA at this crime scene, meaning that they then need to investigate. They need to contextualize that information. They knew in the Kohlberger case that there was a white Elantra that was seen at the crime scene. Now they knew that there was a family in Pennsylvania that was identified. Could they look up a white Elantra that had a Pennsylvania plate or a Pennsylvania driver? Of course they could, and that's part of their investigation. I don't know the order of which the investigators actually investigated that case, but they were able to piece all those pieces together because we gave them the information that we gave them. And as they pieced all those puzzle pieces together, it became very clear that there was only one suspect that was possible of committing this crime. Stacy, do you 
want other families like who are going through? I mean, do you think things need to change? Absolutely. Nationwide? And I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, that's we're just getting started on this. But, you know, e you know, even if you don't know anything, but you know that Othram was involved in identifying a perpetrator, you know, that that's that, that's it, it's a comforting piece of information. The, the, the rest of it, it takes all of all of law enforcement as well. Right. I mean, it still takes this entire case. It, it, yeah. So. But, but there is a piece that is, is definitively in that home. I think that, I'm trying to remember how, but I think it leaked out at one point. I forget, often it came out at some it point. It did. I don't remember how exactly. Out, um, I think it was a New York Times article. That's I'm right. Maybe right or wrong about that being the first source, but they had pulled a contract be be between Idaho State Police and Othram for this type of advanced DNA testing. And so they said, well, they're in contract. So it's very possible that Othram is the lab, but Othram will give no comment, as we couldn't give a comment at the time. Yeah. And, you know, and in this case specifically, which is very interesting, and I don't think we'll talk about this tomorrow, is that had it happened seven miles west in Washington state, they might not have had knowledge of Othram. So the only reason that this thing went to Othram is because the Idaho State Patrol forensic scientists knew about them and when it didn't hit in CODIS then they brought it there like we got to take a chance on this company and had it gone to Washington and you know their forensic people didn't know then potentially it would have gone on I, I don't you know I don't know that it would have gone unsolved because I'm that's it not my job it would have just taken more time right so are there so many cases out there that could be solved? Yes. If what the police just don't know to call you or what's yes. the... Yeah. And you know what? That's what keeps me up at night mm -hmm. because this technology will get adopted. It's clear that it's predictable, it's robust, it's scalable. It's being adopted. You can see that in 2019 we solved five cases. We solved five cases today while we've been sitting here, right? Yeah, five it's, cases today. It's scaling, right? Yeah. And, and those are announcements, which are about 10% of the cases we actually solved. And so, of course, this technology is being adopted. There is almost no state in the United States that isn't now using this technology or hasn't tried it at least once at Othram. So I do believe that in the next few years, everyone will be using this technology. The state labs will have access yeah. to this in their own laboratory. They won't even need to send the evidence to Othram anymore. And I'm so excited about it. But if that takes 10 years versus three, how many victims in between yeah. will be unnecessary victims of serial rapists, serial killers that weren't caught the first time they committed the crime. We were able to stop Brian Kohlberger in this case before he committed that next crime. And, and you don't know who that able... person would be, no. right? I mean, and that's what, you know, we've sat and talked a lot about. You don't know who that person would have been They that got saved. What is it like for you to meet the person or the people who, I mean, it's so scientific what they did, but to put a face to put a face to it. It was amazing. Jim and I hopped the first plane. Yeah. Yeah, we flew to Houston and then Maisie and I have been back. Um, I don't I feel forever indebted to them. I you know, I have a list of people in my heart that you know since November 13th that I feel that way about and and they're on the list. I mean, thank God that they developed something that helped our case, right? And what about for plus, you? I mean, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I just want to say, plus they're incredible people. I mean, they're not just, they've just created something. They genuinely care about the outcome and they care about the people involved. They're just good people and that says a lot about the company as well and all the people there. And for you, what you do is so scientific, but to put a faith, I mean, to actually see the difference that you made. Our technology is based in science and certainty. But our mission is based in advocacy. Um, you know, we all came from a biomedical background, working at the forefront of, of biomedical research or consumer genomics. But these are fields that are well funded. And we moved into forensics where there isn't funding for this new technology um, to make a difference because there weren't enough people working on this problem. And so I think that that's selected for a team of people that were either affected by crime or someone that they really love was affected by crime that understand how broken the system, the current system really is. Um, 
and so selective for people that uh, are relentless in the pursuit of justice here, in the pursuit of creating this infrastructure to help everyone. And so I, I think we're more mission driven than we are science driven. Mm -hmm. For me, for sure, it's all heart. Um, and getting to meet Stacy just solidifies yeah. that for me. Um, I mean, how could you meet someone that you you alter yeah. their, their trajectory in life, right? She won't yeah. have to wonder if right. that person's still out there for the next few years. She won't have to worry about her other two right. children being the next victims of that right. serial killer. And she knows the answer. And I don't believe in closure when something this terrible happens to you, no. But I do believe that the truth allows you to turn the page yeah. to that next chapter of well, what is next? And for Stacey, it's advocacy. For everyone, it could be something different. But it allows her to live her life moving forward and not being stuck in trying to understand the past. And for Stacey's case, it happened in a matter of months. For Jim Walker's case, who spoke in David's talk a few minutes ago, it happened in 47 years. Um, that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. And unfortunately, that still is the case all too often. And in Jim's case, the perpetrator continued to murder other women and other children. And here we stop that. We stop that pattern. And someone's home having Thanksgiving with their family this year that would have been Kohlberger's next victim. And there's so much meaning to that that goes so much beyond science. Right. We really are making the world a better place. Well, thank you both for talking to me. Thank you for showing. I mean, we just saw Gabby Petito's parents when we were walking. The fact that you all can take a tragedy and turn it into something impactful, I think, like I said, is just inspiring in a number of levels. So, and, and I mentioned Gabby Petito's parents because they've done, I they think, have. the same thing. I agree. Yeah. Um, so I mean, if we can make it better, right, for future families, victims' yeah. families, that's important because it isn't easy to go through it. Yeah, but that to me is, is hope. That's the definition of hope that for humanity. Yes, you do see these terrible people, but don't yeah. focus on that. Focus on these people yeah. that have just gone through the worst and are willing to turn it into something good for someone else. And the picture's right there behind right. you. Yeah, yeah. focus on yeah. that, and they're on it. So sweet. And that, to me, is... I think that's the importance of all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.